Our next speaker is an expert with the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe and advisor to the city of Geneva in the telecommunications and smart city sectors. Recently, he's been, he's been, um, we've been meeting each other in Davos and other places, and I'm so honored to welcome here on that very stage, Mr. Marcelo Garcia. Oh, wow, Marcelo. I, I wouldn't miss you, you know. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. Welcome Just to Webit. Right. Welcome to Sofia. Have you finished the chocolates already? This, <laughs> <laughs> this is your clicker. Thank you. Well, Salam alaikum. May peace be with you. It was already dark when my life almost ended because of a tragic misunderstanding. I had just gone through a tense encounter with six soldiers at a closed border between Turkey and the Syrian territory controlled by the Assad regime. They were in full battle gear when driving from the border post towards me and halting around 20 meters away, which is a relatively safe distance in case of a car bomb detonation. They stopped at an angle behind me to be able to engage in combat without risking crossfire with the machine guns at the border post. They were ready for an invasion when I showed up and didn't look too pleased to see me. Although I don't speak any Turkish and they spoke nothing else but Turkish, with some mimicking and by displaying friendly body gesture, they assessed that it was not an imminent threat and eventually let me go. After this very stressful experience, I made it to the Antioch Harbor, 20 kilometers north from the Syrian border, following a narrow road used by refugees and smugglers. I assume it was safe because in more peaceful times, it's a resort to the longest beach in Turkey. On the road up north, across uh, Turkey to Lesbos, I noticed the entrance to the Titus Tunnel, a two millennia old UNESCO candidate site, which is always open. I decided to stop and visit, not knowing when I'll be back to the troubled region, and that decision almost ended my life barely 10 minutes later. I walked along the tunnel for a few hundred meters and went up to a bridge crossing it to see the site from above and to have a view of the highly historical beach where Marco Polo moored with his father and uncle coming from Jerusalem on their way to China. Before heading back to the site's entrance, I took a last picture of the beach, and that's when all hell broke loose. I wasn't aware that between the UNESCO site and the Mediterranean, there was a concealed military base without any panels indicating its presence, not even in Turkish. As you can imagine, the soldiers are not really very happy to see a stranger taking pictures of their facilities. They started screaming orders in Turkish that I could not understand, and I replied, tourist, tourist, tourist. As that's a word, no, it's Turkish as well. That's pretty much the only tool I had. But apparently when it's said three times, in Turkish it means please shoot me, because that's what they did. They probably missed me on purpose until being certain that it was really a, an enemy combatant worth executing. But what happened next is quite fascinating because my brain basically shut down the higher logical functions of the frontal cortex and passed the control to my reptilian brain, the one that drives the deepest instincts to stay alive in death-threatening situations. Being a reptilian, I like to call mine Lacoste for the brand with the crocodile logo. Well, Lacoste immediately realized that there was a waist-high bush in front of me, preventing the soldiers from seeing the lower half of my body, something that would certainly make them nervous. Lacoste also told me that they were screaming orders in Turkish, which I was unable to understand, that they could interpret my actions or lack of actions as hostile, and send a second bullet with my name on it for good measure. Therefore, I crouched behind the bushes and started running back to an area where they had a clear line of sight and could see my whole body. Once there, I had two options. I could either run back to the tunnel, where I almost for sure would be trapped and killed before they would ask any questions, or surrender and hope they will understand my peaceful intentions. The whole process from the time when they first shot at me to deciding to surrender took around five seconds. Any mistake could have been lethal in that kind of situation. I may be a tough negotiator in civilian life, but that soldier had 20 excellent arguments in his rifle cartridge. And um, 
basically Lacoste told me to do the following. Drop on my knees, throw my phone away, because it looked like a detonator with the charger cable coming out of it, and then put my hands high up, showing all my fingers, so they wouldn't think that I had a weapon behind my head, which is what you can do when you have that, either a knife or a pistol. That's what I did. And Lacoste's plan worked, because one of the two soldiers slowly started coming my direction, saying, panic yok, which I correctly interpreted as meaning, don't panic. While the second soldier kept his rifle pointed in my direction, the clear line of sight from two meters, 20 meters away, and it's very hard for a trained shooter to miss a static shot uh, from that distance, and you know, he had 20 bullets to keep on trying. So the first soldier actually looked more nervous than me when he was checking that it was indeed a phone that I had thrown away, then patting me down, searching for the non-existing weapons, then kindly asking me to follow him. At that point in time, I knew I was going to live. So Lacoste gave the control back to my frontal cortex. Thanks, buddy. The soldiers escorted me from the UNESCO site into the military base without any violence, and we went past attack dogs, camouflage tanks, and many weapons on the way back to the barracks. While they were waiting for a translator, they offered me a rather boring cup of tea and uh, mimicked several times how critical it was that I had surrendered following a recognizable military protocol, gesturing that they would have executed me immediately otherwise, because the expression, bang, bang, is very international. So, the trigger-happy attitude is not at all surprising, because although I didn't know at that time, earlier on that very same day, one of their soldiers had been murdered by a smuggler in a random knife attack. And the Turkish army had started shelling Syrian Assad positions and were expecting retaliation. Then I show up. Talk about bad timing. After checking that it was not an enemy combatant, they let me go, quite embarrassed and very polite all the time, that is, before shooting at me, before offering me tea. And that was my experience during uh, my week as a refugee. You can get more details later on in the whole story. So I'll just let you reflect that similar situations happen on a daily basis involving desperate Syrian refugees. Just like me, you can't speak any Turkish. And they try to cross that border towards safer locations in their hellish country. I think it's fair to assume that in their case, the bullets are far more precise and no tea is offered in the package. So now that I'm blessed with your attention, let's talk a bit about how technology can help the world's 50 million refugees, and that's around 1% of all human beings. How can we help them improve the appalling conditions in spite of all the efforts made by United Nations, government and voluntary agencies? So, presentation, hey, lucky me, it's there. A little bit of a history there, you probably know about Syria. You probably don't know that Syria was one of the first cases of WikiLeaks a century ago, because it was carved between the British and French empires. The uh, ideas have zones of influence, Syria stayed with the French, and the Russians are going to get um, Istanbul and control the Bosphorus, that was the deal. But then, oops, they uh, lost power to the Bolsheviks. And the Bolsheviks, to humiliate the Tsar and everybody who was surrounding him, uh, leaked that information to the Russian press, the Pravda and Izvestia, and uh, that was immediately picked up by the UK press. So, Big scandal, a little bit like what's happening in Panama and a few other you know, locations in sunny places full of shady people. And um, for almost 100 years, it kind of worked out fine. But in 2011, they started shooting. So you have more details on the Sykes-Picot agreement that I'm uh, referring to. And that's the bloody mess we have right now. So for five years, I had a very severe drop. So, um, Let's say that climate change is a big component of this crisis. For five years, they lost most of the cattle, most of what they had to live on, and started moving into the cities. 
Now we have this patchwork. I mean, there's a, an amazing website that was initially created for Ukraine, but uh, it keeps on changing every day, and you can go back on a daily basis to figure out who is controlling what territory, and you can zoom in and get a, a, a very high level of detail. And these are some of the people who are there with a gun in their hand and not very good intentions. So you have the Assad regime, they're still trying to control more than half of the population. Islamic State, that's a more famous one. And by the way, when I got there, I was about 10 kilometers from the Islamic State who had screamed loud enough to hear me. Then you have Al-Nusra, which is actually Al-Qaeda, up to no good. You have the Kurds on both sides. Lots of rebel groups that get money from European countries and the United States and a few other places like Saudis and so on. And now you start having Iranian commanders using Afghan, what would call slaves, because they're Afghan refugees in Iran that are told that you either go and fight for us in Syria or we send you back to Afghanistan. It's not a very good choice, is it? And Russian and Serbian mercenaries started popping up every now and then, not to mention US and you know, British soldiers and everybody else. So people started leaving for some reason. And around 86% of the refugees who left, that's 5 million people, and they're living under the poverty line. In the camps, they earn $1.70 a day. That's kind of the average. Now, it's hard to fathom to understand what's actually going on there. So I decided to create a table with the two main uh, figures. And uh, there you have the Syrian situation and the United States situation. For Bulgaria, just get the Syrian figures and divide it by three. That's roughly what you get. So if this happened in the United States, you had, you'd have 75 million uh, refugees. And no, 1.2 million would be in a camp in Canada, and uh, no, 7.5 million crossing there. Oh, it would just let you sink in the figures, but you can get those from Amnesty uh, International. This is the route I did. I just decided to spend my life, at least for a week, as a refugee. So I really understand what it's all about. Started at the Syrian border, went all the way across to Lesbos. Then again, not something I recommend anyone to do these days. That's where they shot me. So I parked the car, went up the tunnel, walked around, UNESCO site, you feel safe, and all of a sudden you have soldiers shooting at you. And they took me back to the barracks and let me go. This is what can change your life. You end up with a bullet in your head in five minutes. Now, United Nations are doing a lot trying to fix the mess. There was a high-level meeting on the 30th of um, April, no, March, um, with all the ambassadors from all the countries doing the pledges, and uh, they are trying to do the best, but this is a very challenging situation. So if you want more details, you can go to UNHCR website and uh, get the information. Now, how can technology help? And I guess that's uh, the one thing you can try to do here. The refugees, in many ways, they are stuck. Well, we, we call them um, a warehouse of souls. That's a nickname for the camps. They have no communications, too expensive. Although they have the devices they took from home, there's no way they can uh, talk to the outside world. So we can do that. We can try to bring technologies such as money that uh, Bernardo uh, explained in far more detail. We can, above all, try to bring them affordable Wi-Fi that allows them, for instance, to teach Arabic over Skype to someone in Australia and try to make money, getting paid on their money card. There are lots of things that can be done there. So many initiatives like TechFugees are coming up with ideas, but the basic, as you can see in that uh, drawing, is like Wi-Fi and battery life sort of come before the Maslow category of needs. Uh, the slides are very dense, so I'll be pleased to send that to you uh, if you'd like to read more about it. don't have much time. Now, this is a Zatari camp in Jordan, 80,000 people living in one huge slum, uncommunicado, with few exceptions. This is what I like to see happening. With 50 hotspots, I can cover the whole thing, and they'll be able to communicate to the outside world. And this can be uh, old equipment that is donated by telecom operators that just have it in storage, or Cisco, or uh, the companies that have this kind of stuff that they cannot really sell, but it's still useful, and that's a good place to use them. We just want to make sure that uh, the momentum starts. So I'm talking as I'm part now of the United Nations system. I'm talking to everybody in HCR and uh, lots of voluntary agencies. 
and uh, trying to get uh, this uh, inertia moving in this direction, we need the pilot site, and Zatad is a, a good one, but it could be pretty much anywhere. These are the etiquette rules, in case uh, they shoot at you before offering you tea. I pretty much describe it. You know, it's like to make sure that you stay alive as a, uh, an order of the day. And the most important one is number 10. You make sure they use good deodorant, because your arms are going to be up all the time. How can you help? Well, thanks for listening. These are the, the good people, usual suspects and the new kids on the block. New kids on the block being technology companies, most of those ideas, they were generated or further developed in Davos, the World Economic Forum. And uh, these guys are trying to do the absolute best to make sure that the suffering is mitigated and uh, these people can have normal lives. So, shukran, teshkur, and thank you very much. Marcelo, one thing is for sure, uh, it's uh, this topic will touch so many people and I believe that this is the right stage to be, to be, to be, to be challenged because, hey, this is the main road. We are at the road and we should not only talk about it, we see it and we should make a difference. And thank you for, I mean, you're not an inspiration. You are more than this. You did it yourself. That was the idea. It's not about talking, it's about doing. It's about being shot in order to really showcase the reality. I would and recommend it to anyone. Sucks. Yeah. The reality sucks. And we have to change that reality. And you are the change. Thank you so much, oh. mate. Thank you for coming. For Thank you so much. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks. I'm so yeah. touched. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.